Welcome to NT501, Pentecostal Explorations of the New Testament. This is Unit 4. Today we're going to talk about the Gospel according to Matthew. Standing first in the New Testament is the Gospel according to Matthew. With it, it begins our journey through the New Testament. This Gospel introduces both the other three Gospels as well as the New Testament itself. It acquaints us with Jesus Christ in the book's opening line, chapter 1, verse 1, and continues its focus until the final words of Jesus in 28, 18 through 21. We'll begin with structure, content, and theological emphases. As with many ancient books, the purpose of the gospel according to Matthew is revealed at the book's conclusion. In 28, 19 through 20, Jesus instructs the disciples to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all things that I have commanded you. It appears that Jesus' words do not have reference to all the things Jesus ever said in his life, but rather have reference to his major teachings as revealed in the Gospel according to Matthew. On close inspection, one finds that the gospel is arranged around five major sermons or discourses. Matthew uses a certain formula at the end of each of these sermons as a literary marker in the text. The phrase, and when Jesus had finished these words, or one very much like it, appears in 728, 11, 1, 13, 1, and 26, 1. As noted earlier, in each case, it concludes a sermon or discourse. Thus, one of the ways to understand the structure of Matthew is around these five major discourses and their content, and it is this that the disciples are instructed to teach to those whom they disciple. The sermons may be described in the following manner. Chapter 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 10, the Missionary Discourse. Chapter 13, the parables of the kingdom. Chapter 18, relationships, that is, discipline in the community. And chapter 24 through 25, the eschatological discourse. From this beginning, the gospel may be outlined in the following manner. Chapters 1 through 4, Jesus the Messiah. 5 through 7, the words of the Messiah. 8 and 9, the deeds of the Messiah. 10, the missionary discourse, 11 through 12, various responses to Jesus, 13, the parables of the kingdom, 1353 through 1727, the way of rejection, suffering, and death, chapter 18, relationships in the community, 19 through 23, Jerusalem, journey, arrival, and controversy, chapters 24 through 25, the eschatological discourse, and chapters 26 through 28, the passion and resurrection of Jesus. From this view of the structure, some of the major theological emphases of the gospel come quickly into focus. Among the many theological themes, the following are some of the more prominent. Chapter 1, or the first point, the first theme, is Jesus is the Messiah. While one would think that such a statement goes without saying, we would not focus sufficiently upon Matthew's major themes if we were not to state this one. From the beginning of the narrative until its close, the reader learns that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah who blesses all nations as son of Abraham. One of the primary ways by which Matthew emphasizes this issue is through the fulfillment motif. Here, the reader learns that not only does Jesus fulfill Scripture in a literal fashion, but also that he fulfills it in a very deep way as well. In fact, he appears to go well beyond it on some occasions. These examples include the prophecy about Jesus being born in the city of Bethlehem, David's city. These include the passage from Hosea, which talks about out of Egypt I have called my son, clearly a reference to the Exodus, or the passage where, where Rachel is depicted as crying for her children owing to the event of the Exodus. 
In these passages, we find that Jesus relives the history of Israel. A second major theological theme is righteousness. As early as chapters 1 through 4, the theme of righteous, of, of righteous and righteousness appears in the narrative. This becomes a dominant emphasis throughout the Sermon on the Mount and later. This begins with reference to Joseph in chapter 1, where the scripture tells us that Joseph was a righteous man. From this and other passages dealing with Joseph, we find that he was obedient, and that righteous and righteousness take on the meaning of obedience in Matthew's gospel. From Joseph's action, we find Jesus being baptized by John. And while John does not want to baptize Jesus, Jesus says we must do this in order to fulfill all obedience, all righteousness. The voice of God confirms that Jesus is obedient. And when it says that, that you are my son, in whom I am well pleased, or as Matthew puts it, this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. As we make our way into the Sermon on the Mount, we have additional references to righteousness, in particular in chapter 5, where Jesus says, I have not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them, and then argues that unless your righteousness it exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, it is impossible to enter the kingdom. From that statement, we get a number of examples of what it means to be more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees. As Jesus goes through a list of things, you have heard that it is said, but I say to you. You've heard that it is said, but I say to you. Do not kill, but I say, do not be angry. Do not commit adultery, but I say, do not commit adultery in your heart. Uh, love your uh, f uh, friends and hate your enemies. But I say, love those who despitefully use you. So in each case, we have an example of the way in which the righteousness of those in his kingdom is to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Then in chapter 6, Jesus says, and when you do your righteousness, and then we'll talk about almsgiving, talk about prayer, talk about fasting. A third major theological emphasis is uh, the focus on miracles and exorcisms. Jesus' mess messiahship is evidenced both in the words which he speaks and the mighty deeds he performs. Not only does he have unprecedented authority, but his mighty deeds of healing and exorcism are grounded, chapter 8, verse 17 tells us, in his atoning life and death, and a passage here that also fulfills scripture. Fourth, missionary activity. The missionary activity or orientation of the gospel is revealed in what we call the Great Commission in chapter 28, but it's also revealed in the missionary sermon or discourse in chapter 10. Here one finds words about the authority given to those who go out, where and how to go, warnings about persecutions, whom to fear, the division which the gospel brings, and the rewards which come to those who aid messengers of the gospel. A fifth emphasis we could identify is the nature of the kingdom. In addition to teaching scattered throughout the gospel, Jesus' teaching about the nature of the kingdom finds an unusual concentration in chapter 13, which contains a number of parables about the kingdom. Here, the purpose, method, explanation, and manner of teaching about the kingdom are all to be noted. A sixth theme is that of discipline. There is a strong emphasis upon the presence of sin in the church, and how it's to be dealt with, described in chapter 18. Warnings against causing a little one to sin. A parable about the importance of reaching the one lost sheep out of 100. Instructions about how to deal with a brother or sister who sins. And a parable about the unforgiving servant. All combined to drive home the importance of this topic for Matthew. Seventh is eschatology. The gospel also contains a good deal of material devoted to the end of time and the return of the Lord. This teaching, largely concentrated in chapters 24 and 25, 
combines predictions about conditions at the end of time, warnings about its suddenness, admonitions about the importance of being ready for it, and advice about how to live, the talents, and how one will be judged, the sheep and the goats. An eighth uh, issue that we could highlight is the issue of recompense. Throughout the gospel, the theme of rewards and punishments figure prominently. A a final uh, theme that we would lift up is the Holy Spirit, the ninth uh, theological emphasis. One can trace the work of the Holy Spirit through the conception of Jesus all the way to the end where Jesus says that we should baptize those of whom we make disciples in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each of those references to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would cause us as readers to go all the way back through the gospel and focus and pick out uh, what we might say are the emphases upon the Spirit that precede. These are then some of the major theological emphases. I'm sure you can find others in the gospel. Next, we'll talk about Matthew's canonical context. Two things should be briefly observed about Matthew's function and role in the canon. First, it's important to note that in the Hebrew canon, the last books in the Old Testament are 1st and 2nd Chronicles. The chronicler gives a retelling of the Old Testament story from Adam to Abraham, Moses, David, the divided kingdom, the fall of Israel, the destruction of Jerusalem, the burning of the temple, and the Babylonian exile. In fact, the book concludes with these words of Cyrus, king of Persia, from 2 Chronicles 36.23. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Quite clearly, despite the despair evident as the book closes, there is a ray of hope. The Gospel according to Matthew appears to pick up the story of God's people Israel in a way rather in keeping with the emphases of the chronicler. The book begins with a genealogy and covers quite an impressive amount of ground in moving from Abraham to Jesus Christ. Thus, Matthew picks up with the the message of God for Israel as Jesus relives the experience of the people. Here in particular, the fulfillment emphasis of the gospel provides a link with the Jewish scriptures which precede. Matthew then provides the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament, which follows, grounding the story of Jesus squarely within the story of Israel. In addition, it's important to note that Matthew prepares the reader for the other gospels which follow by creating a context for their interpretation. The next um, context we will consider is the original context, or the first readers. Several aspects of the original context of Matthew's Gospel are worthy of discussion. These include the following. Authorship. The Gospel according to Matthew, as all canonical Gospels, is anonymous. That is to say that the name of the author does not appear in the text of the document itself. Any evidence with regard to authorship, which may be derived from the text itself, is ambiguous at best. Therefore, in considering this issue, some attention must be given to external evidence, that is, evidence that's outside the text. While the author's name does not appear in the text, a name is found in the title of the book. Although titles were not originally part of the document, it now appears that they were added as a rule rather close in time to the document's composition. Most likely, as soon as a given church had a copy of more than one gospel, there arose the need to distinguish between them. Thus, the name Matthew, which appears in the title of the book, is one hint as to the identity of the author. Another piece of evidence relevant to discovering the identity of the author comes from an early Christian writer by the name of Papias, who wrote a five-volume work entitled The Interpretation of the Oracles of the Lord, sometime between 115 and 135. 
A fragment of this work is preserved by Eusebius, the so-called first church historian. Matthew, says Eusebius, quoting Papias, collected the oracles, the ta logia, in the Hebrew language or Hebrati dialecto, and each interpreted Hermanusin them as best he could. On the surface, it looks as though Papias' testimony is straightforward enough, but there are a number of points at which there is some uncertainty as to the meaning of his words. First, it's not altogether clear what Papias means by the Greek words translated as the oracles, the talogia. Is this Papias' way of making reference to the gospel? Or should the oracles be understood as having reference to a collection of Jesus' sayings, similar to the hypothetical Q, or the Gospel of Thomas? Or do they have reference to a collection of Old Testament quotations which are messianic in nature? Second, do the Greek words translated in the Hebrew language, Hebrati dialecto, really mean that, or is it possible that they have reference to a Jewish style. Finally, what does Papias mean when he says everyone interpreted as best he could? Does this Greek term hermenesin or hermenusin mean translated or interpreted? Now, the end, near the end of the first century, another early Christian writer, a bishop named Irenaeus, can say that Matthew published among the Hebrews a written gospel also in their own language. The question arises, is Irenaeus preserving independent testimony, or is he simply passing on the information found in Papias? Since the gospel does not show signs of being translation Greek, several questions arise with regard to both these testimonies. Given these and other questions, a conclusive decision with regard to authorship is difficult to reach. While certainty on the matter is not within reach, given the early external testimony, it may be best to regard Matthew either as the author of the gospel or the source of the materials contained in the gospel. Another issue related to um, initial context is that of date. When was the Gospel according to Matthew written? Unfortunately, the evidence on which to base a decision for this issue is also rather slim. It seems the Gospel could not have been written after about 110 or 115 CE, as the Gospel appears to be quoted by Ignatius around that time, in his letter to the Smyrnians, 1-1, or in his letter to Polycarp, 1-2. So the date of composition would have to be sometime before this. If Mark were written sometime before Matthew, as many scholars believe, then Matthew would have been written sometime after 65 to 68. The several passages, there are several passages in the text of Matthew, however, that suggest that the gospel was written sometime after the fall of Jerusalem to the uh, to uh, the fall of Jerusalem to the Romans in 70 CE. In particular, the emphatic denunciation of the Pharisees in chapter 23 suggests that these words were recorded either at the time or just after the time when the church and the Jewish community were engaged in an intense struggle, which resulted in division. These words of Jesus would have been seen to have been highlighted owing to the fact that it so fit the context of Matthew, explaining why these words appear in Matthew, but not in the other Gospels. The Gospel itself reveals an ability to include both an openness to the Gentile mission, chapter 28, verses uh, 18 through 20, while at the same time preserving extremely conservative Jewish teaching about the law, chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Such a characteristic indicates that the gospel was written at a time when the community was in the process of redefinition, seeking to keep old as well as new treasures after the destruction of Jerusalem. Thus, a date of composition somewhere in the 70s is perhaps not far off. The place of composition. Again, the, uh, the evidence from which to come to an informed decision is not available on this issue, 
However, there are a couple of hints that may point in the direction of the place of composition. As noted earlier, the earliest reference to Matthew is found in the writings of Irenaeus, who was the bishop of Antioch at the beginning of the second century. From this bit of information, it might be argued that Matthew was written for the church located in Antioch. Such an identification, though far from certain, is not altogether unlikely for the following reasons. As is well known, Antioch's, uh, Antioch appears to have been the location of one of the earliest Christian communities outside of pa Palestine, having connection to the Hellenists who fled Jerusalem during the persecution associated with Stephen's martyrdom described in Acts uh, 11. As it has a close relationship to Paul and to Peter as well. If, as some think, Peter was held in honor in Antioch, it would explain why Matthew included the blessing of Peter by Jesus in 16, 17 through 20, while Mark does not include such a blessing, and may explain why Matthew could have used the gospel according to Mark as a source if it is based on Peter's testimony, as Papias states. In addition, there was a large Jewish population in Antioch, perhaps the largest in all of Syria. Such circumstantial evidence is not conclusive, but may suggest that Antioch qualifies as the place of the gospel's composition. The next context we'll examine is church contexts. In the interest of time, only one example of the history of the effect of the gospel according to Matthew will be offered. Specifically, one text more than any other has attracted the interests of individuals and groups from all over the world, the Sermon on the Mount. Although numerous examples could be offered, our attention will be focused on this text's impact upon the writer Leo Tolstoy. The author of scores of books, including War and Peace, Tolstoy had experienced the horrors of war firsthand, but also knew a life of some privilege. Sometime after 1876, he experienced a spiritual awakening, much of this transformation was the direct result of the Sermon on the Mount. He focused on the five rules of Christ. Do not be angry. Do not commit adultery. Do not go to court. Do not swear oaths. Do not go to war. He embraced nonviolence based on Matthew 5.39, created a commune on his estate, and began to dispossess himself of his property. If not for his wife, it appears that he would have given all that he owned away. For Tolstoy, the Sermon on the Mount was to become a way of life. There are, of course, numerous others that we could mention in the effective history of the Sermon on the Mount. Augustine being one of them, Luther being one of them, John Wesley, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Dr. Martin Luther King, etc., but enough has perhaps been shared to underscore the way in which Matthew has had an extraordinary effective history um, for, for, since its appearance. The final context we'll mention is the Pentecostal context. A look at the early issues of the Church of God Evangel reveals that Matthew's gospel exerted quite an influence on the tradition. Specifically, the gospel was viewed as underscoring a variety of important doctrines and issues. The gospel contributed some to the movement's views on healing, chapter 8, verse 17, the church, 1618, sanctification, 2028, 20, even tithing, 2323, 23, and the return of Jesus and the need to be ready for one's eternal destiny, 2425. And, of course, missionary activity in chapter 28. There is a, a parable that appears in many of the streams of the early tradition, and that is the parable of the ten virgins, five foolish and five wise. In, in nearly all the early Pentecostal periodical pieces, this parable appears with reference to the teaching of the baptism of the Spirit. In the parable, the five foolish virgins are likened to a holiness people who had not yet made the step to receive spirit baptism. They are then um, chided, if you will, for not having enough of the spirit 
to carry them through to the return of the Lord. Only those who have been baptized in the Spirit, so this parable is interpreted to say, have enough of the Spirit to ensure that they will be ready when the Lord returns. And what's significant about that teaching is it does offer an explanation for what the oil has reference to in this parable. And it does pick up on the eschatological orientation of the parable and its context in Matthew uh, 25. Now one of the things that is immediately noticeable at the gospel is the way in which it connects in such important ways with what we call the fivefold gospel, <clears throat> which is the heart of Pentecostal theology, that Jesus is Savior, Sanctifier, Spirit Baptizer, Healer, and Coming King. Salvation, holy living, healing, spirit empowerment, and the return of Jesus all receive attention, some occupying major positions within the gospel. Matthew has much to contribute to the reclamation of the tradition's heart, perhaps as a discipleship manual. The other contribution uh, to which Matthew can make to Pente contemporary Pentecostalism is to encourage a reappropriation of the importance of recompense in pursuing a godly life. 